What does a contraction feel like? How do I know if I'm in labor? And what does a day of labor look like? Wait, is this normal? Hey, I'm Heidi Campbell, a certified birth doula, host of this podcast, Birth Story, and owner of My Doula Heidi. I have supported hundreds of women through their labor and deliveries, and I believe that every one of them, and you, deserves a microphone and a stage. So here we are. Listen each week to get answers to these tough questions and more. Birth Story, where we talk about pregnancy, labor, deliveries, where we tell our stories, share our feelings, and of course, chat about our favorite baby products and motherhood. And because I'm passionate about birth outcomes, you will hear from some of the top experts in labor and delivery. Whether you are pregnant, trying desperately to get pregnant, I hope you will stick around and be part of this tribe. Episode 7. Does everybody have a glass of wine? Because I've got Rachel on the podcast today. She is a friend that I met through my Bradley class. And man, she's going to take us to a place for really all three of her births that you have to hear. There is so much to learn from this woman, and I hope you enjoy today's podcast. Hey, everybody. I'm with Rachel Coley today. She was in my Bradley class yeah. when we were pregnant with our first baby. We were all glowing and mm-hmm. rested. Yeah. yeah. And so now um, Rachel has three babies, but we are going to talk about um, number one, mm-hmm. Rowan's birth, and then maybe sprinkle in a little bit of her, your other births. So Rachel, yes. roll. Tell everybody like who you are because I was stalking your Instagram <laughs> today because it's amazing. I am a very normal person who, um, by professional training, I'm a pediatric OT. Of course, I'm a mama first and a wife first, but uh, my business has always been pediatric occupational therapy and specifically kind of narrowing down into that baby toddler. We call it early intervention birth to three has always been my heart and my passion. And then um, when I started having my own family, I thought I'd stay at home. And then this business, I don't know if this is how it happened for you. It happens for a lot of people this way. Like it just happened to me. This business happened to me and it, it was terrible timing. And it like, it was a very, if, if someone had presented on paper, like here, you're going to launch an online business right now when you have an eight week old, I'd have been like, no thanks. But it just happened. And it was so natural. It was such a marriage of my professional passions and what I was living as a mom and a new mom. And so um, I run CanDoKiddo.com and it is an education website aimed for parents to really increase their confidence as a parent so that they can have a more playful and enjoyable parenting experience while giving their babies and toddlers the best developmental start. Um, So I have my own professional agenda to help the kids, but my heart is also in helping my fellow parents to just enjoy it. It is awesome. So I'm going to say right there, like four years ago when you were just kind of starting this business and here we were both pregnant, like Mm -hmm. for the first time. But like I literally like I'm going to go back through and tell you all the things that I did with my (laughs) first son, Max. So like we literally had this like, oh, God, I don't even know. It was like a muffin tin. Uh And there were like golf balls or something Uh in it. And I like, yep. And he was like grabbing the golf balls. That was like one of the things that we did. The other thing was like we had a fan that we had streamers like and we like turned the fan on. And then I will never forget um, seeing pictures and you post about the Ikea. um, Mm -hmm. What is it? Activity gym. An activity gym. Yeah. But you had hung all of these um, long like. I don't know, links off of it so that the baby could, could get it. Cause it. I was thinking, Oh, I don't even know what to do with this. Yeah. And then there was another thing. Uh, we were on a road trip or we we're getting ready to go on a road trip when Max was like six weeks old and you had posted about like how to, um, like basically decorate the, uh, car seat yeah. to entertain the baby. So yeah. all those pregnant mamas can do kiddo. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's, it's been fun. And the best part for me is when parents, say exactly that like I was able to play with my newborn I had no idea you could play with a newborn and suddenly I could play and now I understood why the play was important because you told me that this is why developmentally this is important so yeah it's really fun um, yeah well I have learned so much from you well, thank you and um and even more now um because my 
now three-year-old has sensory processing disorder and yeah. had a stroke. So I just am on your page like every <laughs> day time. looking in the, the toddler section for mm-hmm. the toddler tips mm-hmm. um, and feeding tips. So mm-hmm. thank you for all that you do. I'm so excited mm-hmm. to hear about your birth journeys with the three babies. Okay. So let's roll. Let's start with Rowan because I remember sitting in Bradley class mm-hmm. And we're all in Bradley class for a reason. Right. Because we think we're going to have a Bradley birth. Right. I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> so <laughs> let's talk about uh, it. I so. think we might have been the only two in our class, too. Isn't that That funny? didn't have like a, a Bradley birth. I yeah. mean, I drank orange juice yeah. at the end of the birth, but that was about as Bradley as yeah. my birth got. I, I think we had, so. my, I know my husband had a beer. He packed a beer <laughs> for the little mini fridge in the hospital. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Rowan's birth was interesting because like at least my audience, I don't know about yours, but I was like the type A high achieving professional woman who went into this thinking that I was going to design my birth and that I was going to follow the recipe. I was going to do the steps. I was going to eat the amount of protein they said and do the Kegels and, and lay in this position and not sit in this position and do all do the formula to give me the birth that I wanted. And um, it seemed to make sense. And it seemed to be like, great, that's the way I'm going to start this mothering thing. And probably this mothering thing is going to go that way, too, um, that I'm going to just find the answers and implement them and everything will be smooth. Bless um, our hearts. I Don't know. you just want to go back? I go back and have a conversation I just want to go back her. and like hug us. I know. And go. Bless. You know, bless, bless you. Heart. You have no idea. I feel the same way about. So our three were born. We did the quote unquote baby bunching. So our three years are similar. Um, our three are less than three and a half years spread between them. And I just remember these conversations before we had kids about how this was going to be so efficient and we were going to just knock out the baby phase and then move on and they'll be close and friends. They'll be good friends or they'll be close in age. They'll be close and good friends. And like, I want to go back and have a drink with that mom and be like, yeah, slow it down. I mean, That's yeah, I mean, my how it's going to look. I had a planned pregnancy at five months postpartum. Yeah. Oh, we so, were six and, months. And you were six months because yeah. I was like, I know that we were like the. The first two in yep. our class also to get pregnant again. Yep. And then Maeve, how close was she? She's 22 months behind Eloise. So, so 17 mm-hmm. and then 22. 22. Yeah. Whew. It is a busy household. It is over a there. loud household. Yeah. So um, Rowan, so that was kind of my expectations going into birth. I did all the things that I was supposed to do. And I, I did my quote unquote research, the beginning of <laughs> tons of mommy research. I love that term. Mommy research, a.k.a. Googling out of anxiety. Um, (laughs) And so during my pregnancy, my dad, um, who had terminal cancer, was put in hospice. And 11 days before I delivered, um, he passed away. And so, and it was a very complicated relationship. So the grief was really complicated. It, not to say it was better or worse or easier or harder. It was just a very, like, raw, complicated grief. Um, And so I was having prodromal labor anyway, where I was having legitimate timed contractions only at night, and then they'd fizzle. And so I was just wearing myself out, not sleeping, not sleeping, anxious. Is Thinking this, this is yeah, it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. then all the self-doubt, like what's wrong with me that I thought I was deli- like in labor last night and I wasn't, and Bradley, should, you know, I should know better. So once my dad passed away, the prodromal labor that had been going on for three or four days really cranked up. And I was just miserable. I really was. And... um by the time I got to the birthing day or actually his labor lasted two or three days, but, um, Mm -hmm. when it really was go time, I just, I felt really good in the beginning and I did all the things I was supposed to do. We labored at home as long as possible. And then once I got to the hospital, it just took a turn for me mentally where all the spiritual metaphysical universal stuff that Ina Mae had talked about in her book, and all those like drum circle births, which is what I thought I was, you know, as much as you can have that in a hospital, that's what I was aiming for. It went to the other side of the spectrum for me. So all of that spiritual stuff went to really dark, really painful, really lonely places. And I just got, it, I was in so much pain physically, that part I was prepared for, but I was just getting my soul ripped open. Like I was already in so much pain going into birth mentally yeah. that all the stuff that was happening during birth separate from my body just wrecked me. I was, and I was so physically tired and mentally tired. Um, and so at about 21 hours of hard labor, not even counting the beginning stuff 
where you can still eat and talk and all that. But 21 hours of hard, hard labor, not really progressing much. I wasn't having very frequent checks, but when they did check me, it was always like, womp, womp, you're still at a four. Um, and when you showed up at the hospital, do you remember like how many centimeters I want to say were? I was like at a three, and I had been laboring at home for 12 hours or something. I mean, and prodromal labor for days. Right, right, right. If not right, weeks, right. you know, before. So, While you're talking, I just want to stop right mm-hmm. there for a second and just say like it is – triggering for me to even hear you talk yeah. because I'm just so proud of you for sharing your story oh. because here I am I'm a doula I'm delivering this podcast and yet I still don't talk about Max's birth oh really because it's very similar to yours yeah and it's hard because we do think that they're and I did as a doula because I watched it unfold for 14 you knew years everything right I knew it could be right and many times was and I I wasn't prepared for a different a different you yeah. know what it shouldn't be you know right. but I went to that I just wanted you to hear me that I went to that very dark totally like not the place I was expecting birth no. to go my other birth was therapeutic. So, you know, we'll talk about some other stuff, but I just, let's say that out loud. Like sometimes birth is really long. And if you have emotional baggage going into Mm -hmm. it, girl, it comes with you to that. Yeah, it does. It rips you right open. So, so 21 hours in at Mm -hmm. the hospital, Mm -hmm. you're like four centimeters and you're Mm -hmm. like, most people are done. Most people are nursing their baby by now and sleeping. So where are you? So the, the hospital, we specifically birthed at a hospital further away from our house because we heard it had a reputation for being very supportive and very natural, as natural as you could potentially get in a hospital setting in our area. So Um, they knew we were a Bradley couple and we had expressed the wish to sort of be left alone, like do what you have to do to check periodically, but kind of give us some space to do our Bradley thing. And so the nurse came in at about 21 hours to to, just to introduce the new nurse because there was a shift change and the new nurse who at the time I had no idea, but she was a doula on the side. She came in to introduce and it was like one of those moments of like, just my gut was being wrenched and both physically and mentally. And she just swooped into my ear. I'll never forget. She was in my left ear with this, like, angelic, calm voice. And didn't even, like, just, I think she interrupted her introduction even. It was like, hi, I'm, oh, you need help. And she got there, and she just walked me through several contractions. I was at that point screaming, like, give me the epidural. I'm done. I'm done. I'm so done. Make it stop. And she's like, you know, talk to me about why, this is between contractions, talk to me about why you wanted a natural birth. Let's talk about that. What's changed for you? What if you stuck this out right now? What what would it be for? What would the outcome like? What would be the purpose of it? And finally, she said, having been through several contractions with me, she said, Rachel, this is painful. It's always painful. There's no way around this pain. But there's a difference between pain and suffering. And she said, I need you to tell me, are you in pain? Are you suffering? And I literally said, mind, body and soul suffering. And she said, then do it. Yeah, do it. And so what that gave me and I did, I had the epidural and then he had some, you know, sort of predictable like D cells and all that kind of drama at the end. And then he came out and he's perfect and wonderful. And I had a beautiful birthing moment. Like that's the part that I didn't expect from all the Bradley stuff is things took a turn and the birth, the labor went a different way. But the, I never forget, they asked if I wanted a mirror because my first couple of pushes with an epidural were not, they were like, oh, bless your heart. <laughs> let's, <Yeah. laughs> let's get you a mirror, honey. Yeah. You don't, you ain't doing Maybe nothing. that epidural is yeah. working a little too yeah. good. You're yeah. doing nothing now. I'm like, did I do it? Yeah. Um, so they brought in a mirror, which kind of at first I was like, are you sure? I don't know. I don't know if I want a mirror. It was amazing yeah. to watch and to feel, I was feeling some pressure and, you know, I just felt like I really owned the end of it yeah. and even without the pain the quote-unquote pain and so what I walked away from that experience the doula slash nurse was Kimmery and what she gave me was in the birth process a real processing of my decision so that I don't look back on that birth as like a failure or anything else it was like I had to change my decision making based on new information. Yeah. This was not the information presented to me in Bradley that this is how I was going to feel in my heart, in my soul, in my body. And so it it 
I'd never felt that like, oh, I failed or this sucked or I can't be proud of this birth. I mean, I felt like a warrior in that last push yeah. when he came out. It was like, yes, you yes. know, I really felt and like how I'd done it. So at hour 21, you yeah. were four centimeters and you were like, I'm defeated. Yeah. And then at somewhere around that is when you got the epidural. Right. How long until was Rowan 36 was 36 hours total. Gosh. Yeah. So it was almost double what you had already gone through. Yeah. Your body went yeah. through then with that. Now epidural. I was able to rest. Once I got the epidural, I was able to rest. Okay. Some. And get a little bit of mm-hmm. sleep and stuff like that. Yeah. So my story, your story, there are, we're outliers. Right. Right. So you have really rapid labors, less than four hours, precipitous births right. that are rare. And then we have these longer than 24 hour. 48 hour, 50 hour mm-hmm. plus, 60 hour plus births, they're also very rare. Right. So the majority of the people listening are going to fall somewhere in the middle, right? Like somewhere in that 12 to 18 hour, like first birth or whatever. Right. But it is so important to prepare for anything. Yeah. And to like burst your mind like wide open mm-hmm. with you have no control over right. what kind of labor you're going to be given right. or what that looks like. And every single baby is different. Right. But like, you know, I wish if I could go back and tell ourselves sitting in that Bradley mm-hmm. class, like, hey, <laughs> it might take five days yeah. or oh, how long was yours with was the like, prodromal? Like seven oh, days? Oh, no. Like two weeks. Two weeks. Prodromal. Yeah. Because it started right. right before my dad passed away. I started a couple of days of prodromal and then it really ran like those. 11, yeah. Well, the last two of those days I was in labor. But, you know, those mid that week. Yeah. Was just, and it's real. Oh. So it's prodromal, but it's real labor. Oh, yeah. It's it softening the cervix. Yes. It's painful f- contractions. Yes. They're exhausting contractions. Mm-hmm. And you're nervous and excited yeah. and you can't sleep. And, and I will say this, too. They prepared the prodromal labor, el- elicited a lot of feedback from people in the world and also from my midwives that this was preparing my body and that I would, might go quickly or that this was like somehow going to shorten my labor and uh, yeah wrong. <laughs> and, or that like oh with all this I didn't have internal checks and so it was like with all this prodromal labor you know people friends of mine would be like oh you're probably already at a three or four and like 21 hours in I was at a four mm. or whatever you know if you have prodromal labor that leads to progress right <laughs> like prodromal labor that leads to six centimeters dilated that sounds efficient to me yeah I was yeah. like that's good but yeah. sometimes it's no. just painful contractions yeah. that don't really go yeah. much anywhere and I didn't really talk to my midwife about it too much, and I didn't, I didn't have a doula, and so I didn't know. Well, what you kind of did at it. the end. Well, you got like end. a free doula, right? Right. right. And that unfortunately, she moved like within a, a week of getting pregnant with Eloise. I was like, Kimberly, can you be my doula? Um, and she was moving, but we did use her partner. Okay. Um, but yeah, it was it was an interesting birth because I feel like I was gifted this processing during the middle of it. Yeah. So let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. Did you ever go to any like counseling or anything afterwards? Or did you have someone that you processed the birth with like those early hours, those first 21 hours with like where you said you feel like you were just getting like ripped open? Or is that something that you just kind of the other births were therapeutic for? I never talked to anyone in a therapeutic context about it. Now Mm -hmm. I was open with people about it after your first, especially when you're in sort of a Bradley (laughs) group, like there's a lot of questions about your birth. And at the time, I also feel like I had friends, a lot of friends who were pregnant and having their first. And so there was a lot of conversation afterwards. So I was able to verbally just share it. And I never hid that part of my story. Yeah. Um, Just that there was so much grief and so much drama labor and, you know, that it was really long and brutal. Yeah. Um, It's so good. I ask that because it's just so important to talk about Mm -hmm. our births, Mm -hmm. whether they're great births, whether Mm -hmm. they're hard births, whether they're something in between, you know? So, but I think just like sharing and being on the podcast, telling the story, you know, Mm -hmm. it's just so important to. Yeah. And I think there's also like for me, when I think about my births, there's so much really rich metaphor in the stories. And I think that we, as a society, not you and me, but um, really sell it short and make it much more superficial. Like all the mommy war stuff or the judgment about 
the actual outcome and how the baby came, what orifice the baby came out of and, and how much medication and what type of medication and how many hours you went natural, whatever. All of that really sells the metaphors short because you can wind up with what you felt like was a failure of birth. But for me, like the metaphor of Rowan's birth, um, one of the many, is the relinquishing of control. And you will learn that lesson as a mom, you will learn it, whether it's through an inter- infertility journey that it begins, whether it's through your labor and delivery that it begins, whether it's through postpartum that it begins, whether it's through toddler parenting, you're going to start the relinquishing of control lesson and you're going to learn it over and over and deeper and deeper as a parent. And so I think we just need to like stop. Yeah. <laughs> stop making birth into something so literal. Yeah. And really embrace the metaphor no matter what your birth wound up being. You know? I feel like I'm in therapy right now. I feel like <laughs> I'm healing from Max's birth, yeah, you know, from was... just listening to you talk. Yeah. Because that really was, I went into his birth like you did. We we had a dream of this Bradley birth and mm-hmm. just really kind of giving that up halfway mm-hmm. through the birth is a difficult thing to do. Um, after the birth with Rowan, do you feel like the hospital like honored like, did you do, do anything like delayed cord clamping or placenta mm-hmm. encapsulation or like skin to skin? Kind of like, what was your like after birth plan? Right. Okay. Um, we had a pretty detailed after birth plan. Um, the only part of it, well, there were a couple of hiccups in it. One was that my husband was going to announce the gender. All three of ours were surprised genders. And my husband was going to announce the gender, but they hold up this like baby who's got his penis in my face. And I'm like, <laughs> it's a boy. And then I was like, sorry, honey, I stole your thunder. <laughs> um, the cord, we actually, we think that they delayed the clamping. Um, we don't remember. And my husband did not cut the cord with him. And we don't remember why, how we literally just don't have any recollection of that whole okay. process. Um, he did have a little bit of tent tension in the room when he was born they brought the neonatal team in he turned out to be 100 percent fine but just as a precaution because of some of his heart rate decels and so i think that kind of skewed a little bit of the birth plan but yeah we were able to hold off on shots and um we were we got a 24-hour discharge which was our wish we had lactation come i mean we just were really supported 100 yeah. percent in that regard now i've got some questions that are going to lead to your other births mm-hmm. too because i remember you tandem nursing mm-hmm. so i always am very curious about this because when <laughs> i got pregnant with max sh- i mean jagger listen to me i don't even know which yeah, whichever after, I, yeah whichever one. one when i get pregnant with Number Jag- two. <laughs> when i got pregnant with jagger max's milk sh- gone yeah. i mean it was gone yeah so I'm always fascinated by tandem nursing. So you get pregnant again 17 months later. No, five, six months later. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah 17 yeah. months apart. Six months later, and you are still producing milk? Yeah. I mean, this is another example of one of those things that, like, you, I think it's really good to research and have your intentions and have your goals. But, like, there's so much more involved than your cognitive processing of something. So yeah. my body had to cooperate with that decision. and it ha- And it was sort of like... I wasn't heart set on it. It was just like, hey, if my body cooperates with this, I was able to get pregnant while nursing. My baby's less than a year. Like, let's see how far we can run with this thing. And then at some point it was like, oh, man, I guess maybe I'm going to tandem nurse. Like, I, that yeah. wasn't ever something I dreamed up or hoped for. Yeah. Um, and I did it twice. I've been continuously nursing since June of 2014. Ugh. You are amazing. <laughs> Or insane. Woo! I just got uh, a hot flash. Yeah, right? I'm thinking about it. Down, yeah. just thinking about it. Tingling. Yeah, so my first two tandem nursed, and then I solo nursed Eloise for a little while, and then Eloise and Maeve tandem nursed until Eloise weaned. So now just wow. Maeve is the only one riding the milk truck now. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so maybe uh, if you don't want to answer this question, I could always cut this out, but do you guys want to have any more children? No. Okay, so you're and good. And you don't have to cut that out. Okay, I was like, we you're done with three. stick a fork in us. Okay. We have no, we're so out of capacity <laughs> like we just couldn't yeah um well three in three years basically four years yeah. is a lot so. and they're not easy kids I mean I know no kids are easy but Rowan and Eloise did not have a good adjustment at 17 months to each other Rowan had a very hard time okay having a baby that close in age and continues to I mean that's just been a real struggle so yeah, we're maxed out. Yeah. Our house is loud enough. And oh we're not goodness. we're not super young, believe it or not. If you know him in real life. Okay. My husband is fifty three. This is mind blowing. Everyone right now is are there pictures of your husband on Can Do Kiddo? Um, a few, yeah. Okay. Not a ton, but a few. Here's another reason to go to Can Do Kiddo <laughs> and follow. Because 
This will blow your mind when you see it's her not- husband. Totally hot, so hot. Oh, thank you. And I agree. Looks like he couldn't possibly be more than 35 years old. It's not fair. And when I married him, I'm not kidding you. I thought and you I are was... not 53. Let's just no, tell everybody. No, but I'll be 38 in a few that. weeks. So I feel like our timing, it was like if we had a little more time and we had spaced our kids further and maybe had easier kids, maybe not, um, we maybe would have. Had, I think our dream was to have four. And then reality, again, it's another thing where it's like it's good to have intentions. It's good to talk about these things and have plans. And then it's also good to be like, let's be realistic about where we are and make a new decision. Yeah. You know, and feel really good about that. Yeah, we a hundred percent were gonna have four, and then while I was pregnant with number two, fifteen, I was like, no, this is it. We're good. We're We're done. done. Yeah. Now we're gonna take a short break to just share a few things with you, and we'll be right back with our guest. I'm so excited to tell you about my first book that I wrote that is launching this summer. It's a 42 week guide to your pregnancy. It's a collection of birth stories. It has a ton of doula advice from all of the questions that my clients have asked me over the last 14 years. It has hysterical partner tips that you will want to read to your partner. And it has journaling prompts because nobody has time to write 20 pages in their journal about their pregnancy. So I've taken the liberty to give you some prompts of things that I think you might want to remember back on after the baby's born. So again, you can go to birthstory.com and pre-order a copy today, and it would mean the world to me. Hey guys, if you're enjoying this podcast, then I need your help to spread the word. If you know anyone who is pregnant, is trying to become pregnant, or just loves a good birth story, if you could send them to iTunes or Stitcher or Spotify or SoundCloud, wherever they listen to their podcasts, and ask them to subscribe to the birth story podcast. So let's go back to Eloise, number two. Mm-hmm. So you're able to still be nursing Rowan, which mm-hmm. is unbelievable. Did did you feel contractions? Like, did it make mm-hmm. your uterus contract? Yes, especially okay. at the end. Okay, because had, I've had a few clients through the years that did this, and um, they were very concerned about miscarrying early on in the pregnancy if they continued to nurse because of the uterine contractions, which is very false. Right. So and anyway, was that ever I, a concern for you? No, I okay. never really felt them early on. Um, I have very strong Braxton Hicks yeah. all three times okay. um, that start around 20, 22 weeks. They got a little earlier each time, but that was really what I felt was really strong Braxton Hicks when I would nurse and sustained that okay. basketball belly would hang around for a minute or two. Um, it wasn't until the very end that they started. It, w- it would feel like that prodromal labor feeling where it would yeah. be like crampy. Um, but it's funny because um, Eloise was 10 days late, which is very strange for a second. Or not very strange, but again, an outlier. Yeah. Day, everyone's like, oh, it's your second. You'll go early. So my mind is prepared for that. You'll go faster. My mind's prepared for that. Um, yeah, false and false. But she, um, I, one of the pieces of advice everybody gave me was like, you should stimulate breasts, start pumping. I'm like, dude, I have a nursing baby. Right. Like, I'm, I'm Can't good on Can't stimulate that. them yeah. anymore. Exactly. Um, yeah, it's a little bit, a little bit different the second time around with that. Yeah. But. Okay. So tell me about the like day or night that you went into labor with Eloise. Like, what did it look like having a toddler like, oh. that you have to do something with Which, in order to labor? Interestingly, when I was pregnant with Eloise, that was the bigger concern. I think this is pretty common, especially if you have um, a young toddler when you're pregnant the second time around or third time around. My biggest concern was for my toddler's well-being. What am I going to do with him? Who's going to care for him? Will he be scared? He'd never really been away from us overnight because he was still nursing. Yep. And um, so that was really my more my concern until I went into labor. Once, once I was in labor, I was like, wait, Rowan who? Yeah. Um, <laughs> take me to the hospital. Get me out of here. Um but I actually wound up going into labor on day 10 from a membrane sweep. I had a um, okay. scheduled induction, which I did not want to do. But obviously at 10 days post date, they were like, mm, pressure, we least, pressure, pressure. Well, we pressure. at least have to get it on the books. And I was done. I was so done. Yeah. Like, so. And when you've had the experience like your first, sometimes it is a very big sense of relief mm-hmm. when they're like, no matter what. 
on Tuesday, you're going to be in labor with controlled contractions. Yes. And you're going to have a baby. And we didn't so. get there, so the induction was scheduled for a few days later. And so they you did had it though. So yeah. you were like, okay, yeah. definitely have this day. Right. Baby's By coming. Friday, baby will be here. But let's just do the membrane sweep to see what right. happens. Which I was totally willing to do because it if it felt more natural. I talked to my doula about it, and it was like it felt more natural than the induction. This felt like a better alternative. Yeah. And were you dilated already? Hardly. No. I think okay. maybe like I was too. Hey, uh, I mean, it's something, yeah. but, and I don't think I was very, afa- I think I was like 40% or, you know, okay. it's something has, yeah. was happening, but nothing dramatic. They weren't telling me you're going to go into labor tonight. Like they do some yeah. people. They're like, uh, let's sweep your men. Yes. <laughs> um, and that worked pretty efficiently. Like within, I don't know, three or four hours, things started moving and, um, our doula came, we labored without a doula for a while, while it was comfortable. And then at about 2 AM she came over and continued to labor at home we did all the bradley stuff and this time around our intention and our goal was to try for a natural birth but we at least entertain the possibility that like if we get to a, a place like i did last time i will not feel like a failure if i wave the white flag yeah so we're okay with any and you outcome. will not suffer again right right right, right, right. Like, i was not going to go near that place yeah good for um, you and so and i don't when when we say suffer like you and i both know because we've been there but we're not talking about like this hurts really bad we we mean like soul suffering you know yeah, like it is it's very different it's hard to even verbalize yeah i literally was saying things like i'm alone in a desert dying someone's and why yes. is no one saving me yeah i <laughs> so and i'll be really transparent i didn't even think i was going to go here with anyone ever but when I had to fill out the paperwork at the end of the hospital stay that says, do you have suicidal thoughts? I wrote on the paperwork I did during labor mm-hmm. because I absolutely did. Yeah. It was not, it was not, again, not the pain. It was like almost like the fatigue mixed with pain yeah. unleashes something inside of you that is dark Mm -hmm. and I remember thinking just give me a cesarean or God bring me to heaven yeah because I'm done yeah I cannot be I felt like I was being tortured well and I felt like because of this this terrible I should not be telling all these things on this podcast but it's a learning experience and the the combination of that soul pain plus the duration so it's like I can't live in this space anymore and I've been in this space for hours you know there's there's a difference between dipping your toe in that water and being like treading water in that water for so long yeah you know yeah um so Eloise's birth very 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 slow did not and zero progression like literally so zero. your doula is there at the house yeah you and transition. at some point we um at some point we moved to the hospital okay they checked me and it was sage i think we've shared a um a midwife but yes and she checked me and she I was love like her. oh well technically you're not in active labor because they had changed the rules right so now it's a six isn't that right you have to be a six to be considered active labor I don't know. Dilated to a six. It used to be a four that they had to admit you or whatever. I keep my clients at home for a really long time. Well, I was at home (laughs) for a really long time. But um, I was like, hmm. But I don't know. Well, and the other thing, because we birthed further away, there was a traffic factor that sent us to the hospital a little before we normally would have because yeah. it was going to be rush hour and we had to okay. like fight the rush hour traffic. So it was like four o'clock. I think it was like, well, let's go ahead and go and beat the traffic. So, um, but I mean, I was, I was laboring hard. Um, and then uh, just didn't progress at all, at all. Like my cervix was going nowhere for hours and hours and hours. And finally they said, um, we can do several things, but one of the things we can do is break your water. I said, let's do that first. And then we'll talk about Pitocin later, but give me a little time with the broken water and see what we can do. So they broke my membranes. Um, and then things amped up even more, of course, as I knew they would, my doula knew they would. And then after, I don't know, time stands still 75 hours. No, I'm just joking. A <laughs> couple of hours. Um, I was, things were stacking up. Like I was getting no break between contractions. I was having all those weird hiccupy, nauseous, burpy. Ugh. And I was like, I'm done. I'm done. I want the epidural. And my doula was like, are you, if we checked you, because again, I wasn't getting a lot of checks. She was like, if we checked you and you were a nine, would that change things for you? And I was like, yeah, I think I could do it. And she was like, well, let's, let's get you checked and just see, because I really think you're in transition. Okay. 
I think I was at like a four. Oh, so you totally tricked everyone. Yes. And this I didn't happens want, I will so not often. tell you what words came out of my mouth. Because yeah. again, it was literally like the 21 hour mark. Yeah. 21, 22 hours. Okay, so let me just interject right here as a doula because I have been tricked many times before too. And it turns out that when I see this happen, it's mm. the position of the baby. Mm. The baby is either face up or the head is turned to the side and is not coming down right. to put pressure on the cervix. Yeah. But the contractions are the intensity right. of the end of labor. So it's almost like the position of the baby and the stage of labor are not in sync right. with each other. Yep. So like I'm tracking right there with your doula because I would have been like, yes, let's check but then right then I would have known we have to get the baby to turn right and come down right you know so Um, and also interestingly I don't know from your doula perspective what this is but definitely with my first two babies during prodromal labor and during real labor being on my side was horrible and I know that they say in Bradley like go into the pain if if a certain position hurts worse go there but it was more than that it was like completely intolerable like it would cause me to have weird reflexes and stuff because it was just so intense yep and so i mean i could never figure out was that better or should i've gone there more it actually was the position that also ca- caused the d cells, cells. for See, i'm the opposite i'm like we're we're gonna move you out of it not into it right and yeah. they did so my philosophies was, i'm like leaping out of the bed to get out of it yeah um so anyway so i did wind up getting an epidural with eloise around the same point 21 22 hours now from that point on it was a little bit faster i think she was about a 28 hour labor total okay um talk to me a little bit right there about the epidural though like so for everybody listening mm -hmm. and they're we're trying to teach everybody something like if you're you have this beautiful bradley birth plan you know but you're at the 21 22 hour mark an epidural is a tool to help you have a beautiful birth Many times. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about like, what does it look like to get an epidural? Like, what did it feel like? Like, what what was it like? I can actually talk about two different visions of it. So with babies number one and two, it felt like being terrified because I knew it involved some sort of needle in your back. You can't see it, but like it, that just, that conceptually felt very scary. Um, And I never even saw the doctor either time. Like, no one ever came around that side of the bed because they've already got you prepped on the side of the bed. You're bent yeah. over a pillow. And I always thought it was strange. Like, you're an angel from heaven about to give me an epidural, but you're not going to come around and face-to-face introduce yourself or anything. They just, like, swept into the room, draped you, scrubbed you with some cold stuff. And then with Rowan, it was pretty – it was like having a shot in your back, basically. But with Eloise, um, I, f- I felt, like, weird zings down my legs, like kind of nerve things. And they said it was okay, but it was very scary because it doesn't feel okay mm-hmm. in your body. You're like, ooh, ooh. What's that's a, a very strange sensation, um, and then it slowly starts to work, and they give you a little button, and if it's not working as well, you click it again and get yeah. more. I have. Very, do they ask you the questions like, do you have a funny taste in your mouth or ringing in your yeah, ears? Yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. You know? And I do have very low blood pressure anyway, and did throughout pregnancy, and so I always have a hard time with um, blood pressure drops. So I'll get really like kind of groggy headed and like um feel kind of nauseous and they'll yeah. check my blood pressure and say oh yep yep and they, then they give me epinephrine and they have to keep doing that pretty much for the rest of my labor yeah just to keep me at a healthy blood pressure yeah um and it does slow things down i mean it's hard to say in the first two but with Maeve, i will say i think it slowed things down which is what we learned in bradley um and you're stuck in the bed so there's not the ability to move around and all of that but um did they have the peanut balls yes. at the hospital mm-hmm. by then? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I remember when they did, about three or four years ago, they were doing the trial of the peanut balls. Mm-hmm. So so you, did they give you the peanut ball? I don't remember it with Rowan. Um, I do remember it both in labor before the epidural with Eloise. They put me on my side with a peanut ball and I literally threw it across the room when I had a contraction because it was just so, that position was so bad. But um, I don't remember it after the epidural with Eloise. 
Maeve, definitely. So I had an epidural all three times. My third epidural was more planned. Like I had an epidural right when I checked in. Yeah. Um, like, hey, I'm not messing with all that. Yeah, like, let's just yeah. go for that. And, well, and I also I had sort of the same birth plan in my mind. Like, let's go natural as long as we can and then do the epidural. But I was progressing quickly. It was my third baby in three years. Yeah. And your for, body figured it out. For once my cervix <laughs> was like, wait a second. I think I'm supposed to open here. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I did wind up with some Pitocin with Eloise, my second. Okay. Um, because. To pick things back up. It just was not. Well, it just never progressed without an epidural, without the, I mean, with the rupture membranes like nothing was getting it going yeah um and so they wound up giving me some pitocin and that's the point at which i also had the epidural kind of consecutive like all at once i'm gonna interject just right here the fact that you were delivering with sage in with midwives in this particular hospital Mm -hmm. i am certain that is why you had vaginal births oh i agree you have especially so many people listening have this same story Mm-hmm. And ended up in a cesarean. Well, section. and with Rowan, with the D cells and all that, yeah, we could tell at the end that we were that was the decision on the table, and at any second it was going to go that way. I mean, they were literally saying things yeah. like, "Let's watch him through," or "It." They didn't know what it was. Let's watch baby through one more contraction. Yeah, like I mean, we knew we were on the chopping block, the literal chopping block. Yeah, um, and luckily, for whatever reason, I think they were like, "Let's do one more check," and like I was crowning. I mean, I like. Yeah. Boom. He's there. Okay. Just <laughs> okay. kidding. Let's go ahead and get him out. Yeah. Um, but yes, I agree. I think that the Bradley preparation, being very intentional about having midwives, having a doula the second time around, um, particular hospital chosen because they're supportive of natural, all those things, despite the fact we wound up having more interventions than my idealistic Bradley student mind wanted, yeah. I still got the vaginal birth. But also knowing when to use the medical the interve- intervention. Exactly. Like timing of the epidural is yep. so important. Yeah. Like the further you go, the better your mm-hmm. outcome. And mm-hmm. so like I just hear so much strength pouring out of yeah. you that you like rose yeah. through all of that. I mean, just rock star oh, status. Thank you. And I'm so. a really good pusher, too, guys. I mean, like, we're talking. Like, well, you're in a very good shape. So <laughs> I'm like, you're in very good shape. I think squats, squats would yeah. become very easy for yeah. you, you know. Um, and so. then, yeah, so my third baby, um, I actually, when I checked in, and we went to the hospital quickly. I, I had a membrane sweep. I was a few days late. She was like 41. No, she was 40 plus six or something like that. So she was late, but not or post date. Obviously, my cycle is funky. I mean, that's the only answer for why I have a second and third baby that were um, that late. But um, she I had a memory and sweep instantly went into labor, like in the parking lot, had my first real legit contraction. Where I was like, oh, it's go time. Had to go home, pick my, this is like third mom, third time mom, had to pick my kids up from preschool. Right, like I'm not ready for labor. Yeah, like, I'm uh -uh. like, uh -uh, stalling. (laughs) Um, This can't be happening today. Um, And that was like at 11 or 11.30, I had a membrane sweep. And at two o'clock, I was in the hospital. In fact, when I called the midwives to say, like the office to say, hey, I'm headed to the hospital she was, the girl was so confused because I had a non-stress test at 11. And she's like, what? And I'm like, yeah, no, I'm in labor, like <laughs> two or three hours later. Cancel um, the NST. Yeah, yeah, right. No, I'd already had one that morning. Oh, you had already yeah, had at like it. like 11 a.m. Oh, so you had the NST and the membrane sweep yes. together. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, so they were all sorts of confused. And this but- is literally three hours later. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. I'm at the hospital, checked in at a six. And let me tell you, Heidi, like, were you like... I'd, I'd never gotten to a six before. Yes. Like, I mean, I guess with Le- yes. with Rowan at I like I mean, you delivered hours. your babies vaginally, so yes, eventually. Uh, yeah, but, but yeah. like on my own. Oh. Well, with Eloise was with Pitocin and with Rowan was probably with 30 hours of labor and an epidural. So I was like, what? I'm at a six. I was like high-fiving. Yeah. Um, and wound up getting I was like I want to labor as naturally as possible for as long as possible and they're like girl if you want an epidural you better get one now like we got to get this ball okay rolling. and you did not use a doula on number three no and we just that was a very intentional decision for financial reasons okay <laughs> because we decided to a lot that money towards postpartum help for our toddlers because we were going to bring a newborn home yeah and have two toddlers yeah who are hard kids who don't get along like it just was like, that's where we needed our support yep. was postpartum. If um, you don't, anyone listening, if you don't have a doula, financially, 
it is very important to, I'm just going to say this because mm-hmm. it is, there are so many doulas who are available, who do payment plans, and yeah. who are um, training mm-hmm. and who need births to get experience. Yeah. So I just want to kind of interject really that right there. So if someone is willing and really wants to have, like, where there's a will, there's a way. So if there is someone out there listening that does want a doula and but doesn't have $1,500, right. frankly, to spend on a doula, then um, there are options That's good to out know. there. So doulas and training are a really good, especially if you're on baby three, right? Yeah. Like, this is not your first you know, shindig, you kind of know what's going on, you know what you need and some support, and you may be able to really help a new doula in training. So I'm just going to interject right That's really good. I think we were so So. focused because we'd had one for our second, and so we only ever considered her. Yeah. So I was like, well, we don't want to pay the $1,500 or whatever it was for her, even though she's amazing and worth every penny, but we would rather use that amount of money for a babysitter. To take care of. But we didn't even consider alternative. Yeah. So that's why I just interjected a little bit. It is so important to have that plan mm-hmm. for your toddlers. Like even if you don't have oh, money, gosh. find the money to have babysitters yes. so that you have some postpartum silence Yep, with just one baby. And we, so another, whether you edit this out or not, I think it's important to at least automatically it. not editing it. And I don't even know what you're going to say. So um, just say it. So Preach, the mama. first time around, <laughs> I had my first baby boy. I was so excited. And we, at the time I was working or had been working for our church. So a lot of people interested in seeing this baby. And, and we got married at our church and met at our church. So like just a very big community. And people wanted to bring us meals. And it was so generous and so wonderful and so flipping overwhelming for me. And you don't know what you're going to need or want postpartum until you're there. And yeah. so it never even occurred to me to have any sort of plan for visitors. Um, And I had a summer baby and I'm not super anxious about germs. So it wasn't that it was literally like I was in so much recovery pain and also needed to do so much for my own body and like figure out this nurse. It's not like when you have a three day old, you're like throwing a nursing cover over you and like doing it. It's a three ring milk squirting circus, or at least it was for me. Like You're like, how do I even put this nursing cover on? And like, how do I hold the baby's head up to my Boo. Yeah. Like, and, and I'm like literally spraying like a fire hydrant <laughs> yeah. out the other side and everything's kind of sore. Yeah. And then you're going, how many holes are on? Like, I don't know if you're like me. I thought there was like one hole on your nipple that like milk came oh, out. I didn't realize there it's was like, like a like sprinkler. 20. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the things just, you don't know. No. Exactly. So my, um, that was one of the things that my doula really helped with the second time was like, let's make sure we have a plan for, for, people afterwards and then um when we were talking about the third time around really wanting that postpartum kind of babysitter support extra set of hands we do have my in-laws are local and we have people that we could have called on and i felt really vulnerable like there was something about it It was like i don't want a family member that's not i mean my mom would be different but like i don't want a sister-in-law or a mother-in-law or it just i had a real privacy thing Mm -hmm. um and so I was much more willing the second and third time around to kind of honor that and be like, I don't want visitors. I've learned through experience that I don't want visitors. And so my my advice to someone the first time around, since you don't know how your body's going to feel after birth, how your psyche is going to feel after birth, is to plan, err on the side of fewer people and then call on people if you need or want them. Does that make yeah. sense? Um, because it's a whole lot easier to say yes, come, than to say no, you know, in the moment, no, I don't want to see you. Um, and I feel like, which I'm, isn't really what you mean. It's just like, no, I need, I need my sacred space. No, I, well, and also I need to be in a sits bath every like two hours. And yeah. that's not, I remember saying, if you want to come over and do my dishes, great. But yeah. like, I don't need anyone else to hold my baby besides yeah. me. Yeah. And right with, now. with Ro- Rowan was having from my sec when my second was born, my firstborn was having a really hard time when visitors came over because everyone was ooing and eyeing over the baby. And yeah. So, well, this is a good, they didn't ask me to do this, but I'm actually going to plug right here. Anyone local in Charlotte, queen city, newborn care. Mm -hmm. I don't know who you used, but this organization run by Meg coffee is amazing. And it is a network of, 
postpartum caregivers Mm -hmm. that do um, night support, Mm -hmm. postpartum support. I mean, just kind of all of it, just pampering moms like post-birth. And it's a really beautiful organization. And so I just wanted to put that in there. Like for anyone who's kind of maybe feeling or thinking that they're going to feel kind of like how you are feeling, like you don't want your sister-in-law, but you do want help. Someone. Yeah. Yeah. It felt better. And and the support we got the third time around was just babysitters for the toddlers, just someone in the evening. Yeah. So dinner, bedtime, just an extra set of hands to help my husband handle that or just to give me the space to either be nursing baby or take a minute to cuddle a toddler while the other two were, you know, being cared for. So, um, so anyway, that was, that was different. The third, the second time was very different. And then the third time was really different because we actually enlisted some support there. Yeah. So if you could look back on like all three births and experiences, like, do you have a favorite moment or a funny moment? Like that you tell stories about? I do have a funny moment. Okay. Okay. So this is, uh, with Rowan going, this is when I went into labor was it was a Monday night. I will never forget it. I had been at a women's group. My husband had been somewhere. It was about 9 p.m. And my husband has a bunch of friends through rock climbing who are younger, single, like just in a different stage of life than we were at the moment about to have a baby. And I'm driving. It's dark, 9 o'clock, pulling in my driveway. And I see a bunch of cars parked on our street, which isn't super unusual. But I'm like, I literally thought to myself, someone's having a party. And then I see a guy walking down the sidewalk with a six-pack. And he turns and walks down my driveway. And I'm like, what? It turns out, as I pull in the drive, um, mind you, like 39 weeks pregnant or 38 weeks pregnant, um, our friend, one of my husband's friends, had had him through himself a going away party at our house unbeknownst to us so i pull in and there's like 30 people on my back patio and hashtag clueless oh my gosh (laughs) so and p.s my dad had just died like it was just kind of like off dude dude Um, is this person still in your life yes okay we love him and it's totally (laughs) fitting for him to do this okay but we're sorry we're laughing about you no he'll never listen to this podcast okay um so anyway, so I go inside, I'm, I, I make my hellos, I try to be friendly, and these are not close friends of mine, these are my husband's friends, I go inside, I'm like, what? Who does this? Oh my God. So I'm steaming and fuming, I go upstairs, I told, I kind of whispered to my husband, like, I, I gotta go to bed, like, this is insane. And I, I'm upstairs, and I'm starting labor, and I'm like, I think it's not prodromal, but I'm not quite sure yet, so I'm just like, what did I say? I said, shut it down in a text message. I said, shut, shut it, it down. down. <laughs> then I hear this friend, the qu- friend in question, and my husband talking in the kitchen. I, I look out the window and it looks like most people have left. And I hear cabinets slamming. And in my head, the story I'm creating is that they're getting into the liquor cabinet. And my husband's not a big drinker at all. But with this particular friend, I could see him like having a few shots of whiskey or I don't know what they would drink. I'm sort of like, great. He's going to be like, shit canned when it's time to drive me to the air or to the airport the hospital <laughs> so anyways yeah the, time I will, for uber uh, i will i will never forget <laughs> just like the mama rage of like you're violating my space i think my body was already knowing that it was coming yeah N- my, not in my mind but my body was doing all of its hormonal stuff to prepare yeah. and i just went into this rage of like this is my space and not only are you violating it but you're violating it in the most like clueless disrespectful way like yeah. you threw yourself you a party no at my idea. house and i'm in labor upstairs um yeah so. someday this person may or may not yeah. have an idea yeah. of that um well i love everything that i've learned from you <laughs> yeah. today and just sharing like i really feel like honestly like i feel like i've been in a little bit of therapy and i also feel like i might have shared too much but no. whatever and so before we're done Do you have a favorite baby product or baby products that you used that you want to share about? Yeah. Yeah. Um, So my new recent favorite, I actually didn't use because it came out like a few months when Maeve was like a little bit past the stage. We use it a little bit now, but um, there's a company called Love Every, which is all one word, L-O-V-E-V-E-R-Y. And they started out making a play gym, which is beautiful and awesome and i had one and loved it with Maeve, but they recently came out with play kits and it's a subscription box that comes every once every two months, but they really far and away more than anyone else enlisted the help of developmental professionals. 
And so every two months, if you subscribe, you can eat, you can buy each box individually, but it aligns with the baby's development. It sends you toys. It sends you a whole um, manual of activities you can do and understanding your baby's development. It even includes a little gift for mom every month because, you know, what you're doing is hard. They sent me as just to review their product and try it. They sent me all of the months for the first year. So it's six boxes and each one's stuck, cram packed with all this stuff. And I spread this stuff out. I opened it all at once, and my kids are going crazy going through it all. And I literally thought to myself, like, this is all you need, literally. This is, like, the best toys on the market, aligned with your baby's development, and literally it's enough that that's it. That's all you need. You wouldn't have to stress about anything else. A disgusting playroom that is cluttered with things they don't need. And they're all, like, beautiful wooden, you know, like, all the – they're Perfect. they're visually appealing, so you feel yeah. like you're a cool, trendy mom. But they're so spot on with development. Okay, like I'm going to do a link in the show notes, and yeah. I'm like, cannot wait to go look this. Yeah, up and I'll send you my affiliate link so that they know that it came from me. And it's so. also a great gift for like grandparents and people that want to buy you all the things, but you don't really know what you need or yeah, you know, don't want it more clutter. It's a great gift to send. Yeah. Oh my gosh, so excited! All right, let's high five it, and then we'll pretend like we go back and tell our. Uh, like very young Bradley oh, selves, yes. you know, release control. Yeah, hold everything. It's not that you don't hold it. You hold it with a really loose grasp. Yeah. Well said. Rachel, like anybody who like loved at the beginning here about hearing about Can Do Kiddo and like listening to your story, but like tell us a little bit more about how to get in touch with you and like why brand new parents – need some of the stuff that you're offering? Mm, Good question. So um, why new parents need some of the stuff that I'm offering is because I am all about early intervention, which really means that you head things off early on and you support, you're proactive. You support positive development. You support what your baby's working on. You support good bonding and connection between mothers and new babies um, so that we don't have to fix a lot of problems longer term. And it's also really important because some of the problems that we're seeing um, on the rise with newborn babies are things that pediatricians are still saying, let's wait and see. Let's wait and see. They have a little flat spot on their head. Let's wait and see. And there are things that instead of waiting and seeing that we could be doing um, to head sorry for the pun, to head some of this stuff off. So um, I wrote a book that basically gives parents all of my OT knowledge about preventing flathead syndrome in babies, which is a growing epidemic, and um, also for doing their best to avoid a helmet if their baby already has flattening. It's not a guarantee, but there are things you can do that are not wait and see. Um, and, And just proactive playing with your baby and the things that can help combat all of our fears as a parent, all of the, am I doing enough? Is my baby okay? What All those new mom anxieties and new dad anxieties can really be alleviated with just a little more knowledge and a little more enjoyment of the newborn phase because it's hard. <laughs> that phase is hard. Yeah. So, so where, like, so if somebody's listening and they're like, mm-hmm. oh, what, like either I'm pregnant or like my best friend's pregnant or like, mm-hmm. and like you need this book, <laughs> like you need this book because yeah. as a new mom, you are going to be staring at your newborn and being like, what do I mm-hmm. do with you all day right. long? And there is so much. So like, how do we, how do we get this book? Um, well, there's a couple of ways. So I think or that, these books, I'm sorry. Uh, really, yeah, there's, books. there's a bunch of books, but the, um, the easiest, the lowest hanging fruit is on my homepage, candokiddo.com. That's C-A-N-D-O. K-I-D-D-O. Um, there are a bunch of free email courses for parents where they can kind of dip their toe in the water of this information and you can pick the topic. So maybe you want to learn about playing with your baby. Maybe you want to learn about avoiding the, the um, helmet and avoiding flathead syndrome. Maybe you want to learn about tummy time and how to start doing tummy time really early, um, which is what's recommended is for a full-term healthy infant from the first day, week of life. Um, And so kind of be proactive in your parenting through some of these email courses. And then if you want to dig deeper, um, also on my website, there's a section that shows the books that are about baby play, the books, uh, the book about flathead syndrome, um, plagiocephaly, and then the three courses that I have, which are about tummy time and uh, feeding your baby solids, starting solids, and then one-year-old development. I have a big old course all about following your baby through one-year-old development. Okay. Like, wait, did I hear you right? You said you had free courses? Yes, I have free email courses where I drop in your inbox every day for about a week and I just give you lessons about 
stuff I want you to know as a new mom. And then if you want to dig deeper, you can always um, get some of the paid products, but there's an easier way to start than that. Okay, this sounds fantastic. And like (laughs) right now I'm like tag, tag, tag every single mom that I like, you know, helped doula over the last couple of months. I'm going to be like sending emails tomorrow. So awesome. Thank you so much for coming on. This has been great. Thanks, Heidi. Thank you for listening to Birth Story. My goal is you will walk away from each episode with a clear picture of how labor and delivery might go, and that you will feel empowered by the end of your pregnancy to speak up.